Hello, and welcome to Cell Respiration. This is Chapter 7. As usual, these are the objectives that you should make sure that you are familiar with after we go over the lecture. There are two slides. This is the second slide. So cell respiration. Basically, we're talking about how organisms survive and how they get the energy they need to survive. So all living things need energy. And that molecule that we all use to survive is ATP. So we talked a little bit about uh, ATP before, uh, but now we'll talk about where it's created uh, and how it's created. So the eukaryotic cells will create ATP in the organelle mitochondria. This is the powerhouse of the cell where the majority of the ATP is created. Uh, if it is not a eukaryotic cell, obviously it does not have a mitochondria, and we'll talk a little bit about how that is done in prokaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells create ATP through the process of aerobic respiration. Aerobic meaning oxygen. And so aerobic respiration requires oxygen <coughs> to create ATP. Uh, we'll talk about the equation, which is basically this chemical uh, reaction that is taking place. Um, below is the same reaction, just I put it in word form so you can understand what's being seen. So what is needed, these substrates, you have glucose, you have oxygen, and the products will be carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. So basically, you are taking glucose, breaking it down into carbon dioxide and water, and creating ATP from all of the molecular bonds that hold this large chemical together. Uh, you are breaking those bonds apart to create energy that is transferred into ATP energy. Uh, so we've talked about ATP before. Just a little reminder. Uh, cells use energy in food to make ATP. Molecules in food, such as glucose, are uh, used to produce ATP. Uh, the energy from the molecular bonds uh, will be used uh, to create this ATP, and the ATP will power the majority of the cell activities that are taking place. Cells cannot survive without ATP. Uh, so aerobic respiration is taking place in three stages, and we will list them out here and then go into more detail of each of them. This picture is showing a mitochondria. Uh, not the greatest of drawings, but uh, bear with me. So uh, this mitochondria, you see this outer membrane in dark black, uh, and then the inner membrane is what is separating the tan from the blue. Uh, and so this space that is tan is the inner membrane space. The color blue is representing the matrix. Um, and we'll go over where all of these things are happening. Uh, so glycolysis is taking place in the cytoplasm of the cell, so it is not taking place inside the mitochondria. Uh, it is taking place outside. Um, and basically, 
glycolysis is uh, the beginning of uh, cellular respiration, the breaking down of glucose. Uh, and then once it has been broken down uh, into pyruvates, those pyruvates will move into the mitochondria, as you can see in the picture, uh, through the arrows. Uh, they are moving into the matrix of the mitochondria where they will go through the process, the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Uh, I prefer Krebs, uh, but make sure that you know that they are both the same thing. So if somebody is talking about a citric acid cycle or citric cycle uh, or Krebs cycle, those are all the same things. Uh, and then you have uh, the electron transport chain and that is happening in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Uh, and that is where the majority of the ATP will be produced. And again, the inner membrane is here, or this arrow is showing here. There are lots of proteins that are embedded in this membrane, and that's where the electron transport system is located and where ATP will be created. Um, so before we start, we'll start, uh, I'll explain a little bit about coenzymes. Um, up at the top is an example of one, and that is NADH, I'm sorry, NAD um, plus, so it is an ion, uh, and it will accept electrons and hydrogens to create NADH. Uh, and then if you take the hydrogens and electrons off of NADH, it will go back to NAD positive again. Uh, and so the point of these coenzymes is to hold on to electrons and hydrogen ions uh, for a short amount of time and then release them at a, another time where they're needed. So basically they're involved in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. They're created um, uh, in, the, in the glycolysis and Krebs cycle, as in uh, they will accept electrons and hydrogen ions during the glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Uh, they will then deliver those electrons and hydrogen ions to the electron transport chain, which is the third stage of cell respiration. There are two coenzymes that we will talk about. One is NADH, I'm sorry, NAD positive, um, meaning that it is lacking an electron. That's why it has that positive there. It's an ion. Uh, and so NAD is good enough for me, um, but to know what that stands for, it is nicotamide adenine dinucleotide. The second one that we will uh, be talking about is FAD, um, flavin adenine dinucleotide. And so once they have accepted electrons and hydrogens, they will turn into NADH and FADH2. Uh, so um, just like the top picture shows NAD positive going back and forth from NADH, NAD positive, um, the FAD will do the same thing. Uh, it will hold on to, so, to four electrons and two hydrogen ions, uh, and then when they are released, it will go back to FAD. Um, and so these molecules will be talked about throughout the different cycles. The Molecule glucose, which we have talked about before, it is a carbohydrate, a sugar. It is a simple sugar, um, even though it might not look very simple. Uh, it is one of the simplest of sugars. Uh, and it is held together by covalent bonds. So to the right, you see the string of carbons down the middle. And so there are six of them. Uh, and so between each of them, there are covalent bonds, and then you have covalent bonds holding hydrogens and uh, OHs and so on. Uh, these bonds will be broken throughout the different stages, 
and the energy that is held in that bond will be transferred over to ATP molecules which will hold on to that energy and be released later during cell activities. Um, so the first stage is glycolysis. The word glycolysis means splitting of glucose. During glycolysis, one molecule of glucose will be split into two three carbon molecules called pyruvates. So a glucose molecule has six carbons and it will be basically split in half uh, into two pyruvate molecules. Now this is a much more complicated um, than just a simple split. Uh, we'll go over some small details, uh, but the take home message is glucose being split into two pyruvates during glycolysis. And that will be taking place in the cytoplasm of the cell, not in the mitochondria. And so these reactions will release a total of two ATP molecules. Um, it will need two molecules of ATP to get going and splitting and will be producing four, but as a total, it will be producing two ATPs. So here is a more complex uh, situation of what is going on in glycolysis. So at the top, you will see glucose and through these different steps, uh, these different uh, intermediate chemicals, um, you will then end up with a pyruvate. And so, uh, yes, it is only showing it is only showing one pyruvate, uh, but the glucose will be broken down into two pyruvates. Uh, so that is a key thing to know. Glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose to pyruvates whereas uh, the gluconeogenesis is the opposite, the creation of, uh, from pyruvates, creating glucose from pyruvates. Uh, we will not be talking about this uh, tonight, but glucose or glycolysis will be the direction we are talking about. Um, the, the pyruvate will then be turned into another molecule within the mitochondria, which we'll be talking about later. So this kind of shows the same thing happening uh, as the last picture that we saw, only a little more detail, um, and you can kind of see how the molecules are breaking down and the needing of ATP and so on. Uh, and so, um, Glycolysis will not need oxygen uh, during its process. Nowhere does it need oxygen um, to, to accept anything or to break down. Uh, and so that means that this part of aerobic, trans, uh, aerobic cellu cellular respiration is anaerobic. Uh, anaerobic meaning without oxygen. So this portion of aerobic respiration is anaerobic, meaning this portion does not need oxygen. Um, and so glycolysis can take place in environments where oxygen does not exist, um, and different organisms can, can do this without the presence of oxygen. Uh, in the picture before, I'm not sure if I, I went over, but not only are you seeing um, so here we have ATP breaking down into ADP. So basically um, you're needing one, two ATPs to actually start this process. Um, and then the glucose will split into two molecules and each molecule will go through its own process. Uh, and you see then each of these molecules will create two ATPs, one over here, one over here and then one here and one here. Uh, so four are created, two are needed, so you have a total of two created. Uh, and then here is the first time we see the creation of an NADH, which is basically an electron um, is being stripped from this molecule and 
added to this NAD positive, uh, and then um, a hydrogen ion is added, and so it becomes this new molecule, NADH, which will be later used uh, in the electron transport chain. So glycolysis, uh, the energy that it's yielding, like we had talked about before, uh, two ATPs are invested, and then it creates or forms two NADHs and four ATPs. Um, and so at the bottom, this net yield is a total of two ATPs and two NADHs will be created from glycolysis alone. So this is a nice diagram showing how ATP is created using an enzyme. And so uh, basically what you are seeing what you are seeing on the left uh, is the substrates that are coming in to this reaction uh, and that is the ADP and a free phosphate attached to a donor uh, and they are coming into the enzyme. They are coming into this enzyme here, and with the needed activation energy, that phosphate will jump from the donor to this phosphate, creating ATP as a product. Uh, and then the donor will be released, and the ATP will be released. So basically, what is taking place here? is the energy from a bond within the sugar will be broken and released and transferred as activation energy to create this ATP, to create this new bond that is going to be connecting the third phosphate to the second phosphate. So one bond um, once the pyruvates have been created during, uh, through glycolysis, so the glucose molecule is broken into two pyruvates. You can see that up here. Uh, those pyruvates need to move into the mitochondria. And so uh, they do this in this transition state. Um, so they move through the membranes of the mitochondria. Uh, as they are moving through the membranes, they are being converted into acetyl-CoA. So each pyruvate will turn into acetyl-CoA. And during this reaction, or during this change, a carbon dioxide will be released. So a pyruvate is a three carbon molecule, and as it goes through the membrane, it will lose a carbon and become a two carbon molecule. Um, you can see that here, that this, these two silver uh, balls are the carbons of the acetyl-CoA, uh, and then the three up here was the pyruvate before it entered the mitochondria. Um, so once the pyruvates have been formed uh, and they enter into the mitochondria, that's when stages two and three will be taking place, which is the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain which is taking place both of them inside the mitochondria. Uh, so stage two the Krebs cycle uh, as I said before taking place inside the mitochondria inside the matrix of the mitochondria and so uh, it will need these acetyl CoA's uh, that have been um, created from the pyruvates. Um, and so those will be 
entered into this Krebs cycle. Energy from the acetyl-CoA's will be transferred into electrons, which we will see, um, and these reactions will be releasing carbon dioxide. So the carbons that make these molecules up will then be broken off and added onto oxygen uh, to create carbon dioxide. So these two, um, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, are both aerobic um, chemical reactions. They need oxygen to take to take place. Um, this slide <clears throat> is focusing on this intermediate stage between the pyruvate entering the mitochondria uh, and, and changing into acetyl-CoA and before it enters the Krebs cycle. So as it is going through the membranes, it is going through these chemical changes in order to do so. Uh, and the three carbon pyruvate is turning into a two carbon acetyl-CoA, uh, which means carbon dioxide is being released uh, from each of those. And there is also an NADH that is being created because of this uh, electron being released and having to go somewhere. <laughs> so in this intermediate stage, uh, there is a NADH that is being created, um, and um, and then those acetyl CoA's will enter the Krebs cycle. And so uh, this is kind of saying uh, over here, um, if oxygen is available, the acetyl CoA will then enter the Krebs cycle. If the oxygen is not present. Uh, then it will not go through the Krebs cycle because there is no oxygen to help it out. So aerobic respiration uh, is yielding uh, many ATP. Don't be confused by that one um, up there. It's uh, not meaning one ATP. It's, it's just a typo. Uh, and so the reactions of the Krebs cycle and then later the electron transport chain um, will require oxygen, as I had said before. They are the part of the uh, process that is aerobic. So what we're seeing here is uh, a very detailed mapping of the Krebs cycle on the right. Um, you are not responsible for knowing the names of all of these chemicals and things like that. What you are responsible for knowing is this input-output uh, seen on the left-hand side. Um, so knowing that for every glucose molecule, two acetyl-CoA's will go into this Krebs cycle. Uh, they will produce two ATPs total and they will produce six NADHs and two FADH2s. Uh, um, and so this cycle is going on around and around and around. Uh, an acetyl-CoA will, will come into it. Uh, all of these chemicals will, chemical processes will take place, uh, and then it will attached to another acetyl-CoA, and it just keeps going around and around. Uh, but for every glucose molecule, only two of these acetyl-CoAs are produced, and so two will go through for every glucose molecule. So um, this molecule here, this four mole the four-carbon molecule, is kind of the end product of the cycle, uh, and it will attach to the new incoming acetyl-CoA, and these processes will all take place for that one acetyl-CoA, uh, and it will take place again for the second one. And so looking here to see um, where these NADHs are being produced, um, so throughout the cycle, electrons are being uh, released from the, carb from the acetyl-CoA uh, and 
then, then accepted by this NAD positive um, with some hydrogen to create the NADHs. Uh, another NADH is produced here, ATP, the FADH2, uh, and then another NADH. So if you're counting, you know, you see only three NADHs in this cycle and only one FADH2 and only one ATP. Yes. But this cycle happens twice uh, for each acetyl-CoA, and that's why those numbers are doubled on that left-hand side uh, table. Um, uh, so a breakdown of where we are here. Uh, the Krebs cycle uh, has produced two ATPs, six NADHs, two FADH2s, and six carbon dioxides. Those carbons that were found originally in the glucose molecule have now been released, the bonds have been released, and they are now in the carbon dioxide molecules. Um, so, that is that last screen was what was taking place in the uh, the Krebs cycle. This is a breakdown of what has happened so far. Uh, so in glycolysis, uh, stage one, um, you have a total of two NADHs produced and two ATPs. That intermediate stage uh, where the pyruvates are coming through the membrane and turning into acetyl-CoAs, you have two NADHs produced. During the Krebs cycle, you have these molecules being produced, which we had just talked about. And so a total so far of two FADHs, 10 NADHs, and four ATPs. Uh, these molecules will make these electron acceptors uh, will then make lots of ATP in the electron transport chain. Uh, the electron transport chain uh, is taking place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. You can see it here. Uh, these twists and turns are called cristae, uh, and that is where the proteins of the electron transport chain will be located. Uh, and so the electrons that, been, that have been accepted by these coenzymes will now be dumped out into the electron transport chain where energy will be transferred to the ATP molecules. These reactions will require oxygen and will release water. Uh, so this is a kind of a simplistic photo of uh, what is going on. Uh, and so the top here is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Down here is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And then a simple photo of the inner membrane of the mitochondria with all of these proteins that are embedded. Inside, you'll see the matrix uh, where the, uh, the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle is taking place. Uh, there's a better photo in the next one, and a better picture. And so this photo, uh, you see the outer membrane on the far right, and then a criste fold uh, in the inner membrane uh, happening in the middle. And the white would represent the matrix area. And the, the matrix is where the Krebs cycle is taking place. And so uh, as the NADHs and the FADHs um, have been produced, uh, they will, as they have accepted these electrons and hydrogens from the Krebs cycle, uh, they will be dumping those off. They will be getting rid of them, donating them, to the electron transport chain uh, 
um, to produce this energy uh, to make ATP. And so you see these, these, um, these electron acceptors up here um, in the matrix, and they are releasing an electron to the protein, giving the protein energy to pump these hydrogen ions into this inner membrane compartment. Uh, so there are lots of hydrogen ions in here, which means it is a high concentration of hydrogen ions. Out here is a low concentration of hydrogen ions. So it needs energy to pump these hydrogen ions through the proteins into that membrane, into that inner membrane compartment. And so these electrons are giving the proteins energy to pump those in. And so uh, down the chain, you've got these electrons that are kind of bouncing through the different proteins. Uh, other, other electrons are being released as well, uh, and more hydrogen ions are being pumped in. These electrons have to go somewhere. They don't just, they, they're not just released as an electron by itself. And so at the end of this electron transport chain, or the ETC, uh, which it will be called a lot later, um, those electrons will then attach to the oxygen molecule, uh, and hydrogen will then be accepted as well, and you will have a water molecule. So what is happening here, the electrons are being released. They are going through the electron transport chain of proteins. While those electrons are going through the proteins, the proteins are pumping hydrogen ions into that inner membrane compartment. And then at the end of the chain, those electrons attach to oxygen and hydrogen to create water. So oxygen is needed here. That is why it is aerobic. And water is a product. And so, um, as I had said before, um, this electron transport chain is creating uh, a hydrogen ion gradient. It is pumping a whole bunch of hydrogen ions into this inner membrane compartment, making a high concentration of hydrogen uh, ions. Um, the electrons travel through the transport chain, uh, carrying molecules. Um, Carrier molecules used use the potential energy of the electrons to transport hydrogen ions into the inner membrane compartment. So basically what I was talking about before, um, those electrons are being released and allowing the proteins to pump the hydrogen ions into this internal membrane area. Now, once you have this high concentration of hydrogen ions, um, those ions can then move down the concentration gradient from the inner membrane compartment back into that matrix, passing through a molecule called ATP synthase. So here, you've got this high concentration of hydrogen ions, which will naturally want to pass through the membrane uh, to the low concentration area but they're ions, so they can't pass through the phospholipids on their own. They need a channel protein to help. And this ATP synthase helps that situation. And how it helps uh, is that the hydrogen ions flow through. Uh, and as they flow through, it's kind of like water flowing over a dam. Uh, the water that's flowing over the dam is the energy is able to be harnessed and we can use it as electricity. Well, as all of these hydrogens are flowing through this channel protein, the energy of that flow is able to be harnessed. And so you've got these ADPs um, that are nearby and phosphorus. And so as the energy is being created, the energy is then transferred into making a bond creating ATP. And so this ATP synthase, which is synthase is a word meaning creating, 
um, it is this molecule is creating ATP. And over here we have um, chemoosmotic phosphorylation, and so that is a a term meaning ATP synthase produces ATP, and it's through this chemoosmotic phosphorylation. Chemoosmotic uh, osmosis is the movement, the diffusion of water. Well, chemoosmotic is just a term meaning um, the diffusion of, in this case, a hydrogen ion, uh, and phosphorylation is the attaching or separating of phosphorus from a molecule. And so chemoosmotic phosphorylation is the creation of ATP through ATP synthase. Uh, and so aerobic respiration yields many ATP. All of those NADHs and FADHs that were created through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle will dump off their electrons into the electron transport chain and ultimately the electron transport chain will create 34 ATPs. This is by far the majority of the ATPs that have been created from that single glucose molecule. Uh, and so the ETC, the electron transport chain, requires oxygen <coughs> at the very end, as I said before, um, where electrons are donated to the oxygen, combining with hydrogen to form water. And so oxygen is the final electron receptor. Without it, the chain does not work. The electrons will have nowhere to go, and so they will not even enter the system at all if there is nowhere for them to go. Uh, so oxygen is required. Um, so this is kind of a, um, a tally, a totaling of all of the ATP that has been created from that single glucose molecule. And ultimately, this number is very important to remember, 36 ATP total. 36 ATP are created from a single glucose molecule during aerobic respiration. Uh, knowing the breakdown uh, is important, um, but you you should know the different numbers, uh, but I, I, I don't want to say that you are held responsible for knowing every single one of these things happening here. Uh, basically knowing that glycolysis uh, produces two ATP total, the Krebs cycle uh, produces two ATP total, uh, and then the electron transfer chain creates 34 ATP. Uh, knowing that the majority of the NADHs and FADHs are being created from the Krebs cycle. Uh, and then you've got two NADHs created from glycolysis. Uh, all of those will be entering the electron transport chain where their electrons are being dumped into those chemicals, um, into those proteins to pump the hydrogen ions. Uh, in order to make these ATP. So I, I, I don't want to totally say that you are responsible um, for all of these numbers, but um, this is a take-home exam. So um, if this were not a take-home exam, I would not say that you are held responsible uh, for knowing, but since this is open book, I forgot all about that, um, you will be... Um, you should know these things. So again, uh, glycolysis, um, it produces four, but needs two. So it has a total of two produced ATPs. Uh, Krebs cycle produces two. The electron transport chain uh, will create 34, but it uses two to kind of pump in some of those NADHs from the glycolysis cycle. So ultimately it has a total of 32 uh, and so 2 plus 2 plus 32 is 36 total ATPs created from a single glucose molecule.
Uh, so all of this has been talking about glucose and the breakdown of a single glucose molecule. Uh, and that is the majority of what's happening, simple sugars. Um, but you, your cells, all cells, can use other molecules to break down to get energy. So we eat proteins, we eat fats, um, we can break those down in similar cycles um, <coughs> to get energy, the same types of energy. And so what you're seeing here on the left uh, is proteins entering uh, this system. And so instead of proteins entering at the top, um, they will be kind of broken down elsewhere uh, into pyruvates, and so they will be entering this system as pyruvates. Uh, whereas fats can do the same, they can enter as pyruvates, or they can actually be broken down into this acetyl-CoA molecules and enter uh, as acetyl-CoA molecule. So the take-home message from this picture is that sugars, carbohydrate, are not the only molecules that can be broken down as um, to create ATP. These other macromolecules can as well, um, but they're entering at different spots. Um, I will not ask details about how they enter, um, but it is important to know that they can enter uh, at different locations. Um, where does cellular respiration take place? I mean, we've talked about this, and, and you should kind of know, but it's an overview. Glycolysis uh, is taking place in the cytoplasm of the cells, where the, uh, if this were a eukaryotic cell, the Krebs cycle would be taking place in the mitochondria, in the matrix. Uh, the electron transport chain would be taking place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. But not all cells are eukaryotic, not all cells have mitochondria. Uh, and so um, for a prokaryotic cell, the Krebs cycle would actually happen inside its own cytoplasm. Uh, so think about that inner and outer membrane um, of a mitochondria. It would, a prokaryotic cell would only have the inner membrane. Uh, and so um, the inner membrane then, the matrix, uh, would be its cytoplasm, and your glycolysis would be taking place there, the Krebs cycle would be taking place there, and the electron transport chain would actually be happening in its own membrane, pumping hydrogens in and out of the cell itself. Um, but eukaryotes have a mitochondria, uh, and so uh, they they have this inner and outer membrane of the mitochondria, uh, and so they're able to do what we had been talking about um, this evening. Um, and then in eukaryotic cells, uh, the Krebs cycle would be taking place um, inside the inner membrane, which is the matrix um, in the inner membrane, inside the inner membrane, uh, and then the electron transport chain would be happening in the inner membrane itself uh, through the, the different proteins that are embedded. Um, the term criste is that folding of the internal membrane, um, those folds themselves, and that's where the majority of the electron transport chain would be taking place. Uh, so, we have talked about aerobic respiration. Organisms that are in an environment that has oxygen uh, uses oxygen. Well, not all organisms are able to do that or live in environments like that. So, <laughs> there are other ways of doing things uh, that are slightly different. So many organisms survive in the absence of oxygen. Uh, glycolysis, um, glycolysis would happen as usual uh, because it does not require oxygen to produce ATP. So glycolysis would be taking place um, as usual in these organisms. Um, and so that requirement of, um, so in, in glycolysis, uh, the 
carbohydrate is being broken down and, uh, and some carbon dioxide is being produced. When carbon dioxide is produced, electrons are being released and they need to go somewhere. So glycolysis requires NAD plus to be there to accept those electrons. Um, in aerobic cellular respiration, that NADH would then go into the mitochondria and release those electrons, uh, regenerating the NAD plus, uh, which would be then go back into the cell cytoplasm and go through the cycle again. Uh, so that's important to know um, when there is no Krebs cycle taking place, um, or I'm sorry, electron transport chain taking place, um, and that'll, that'll come into play in fermentation. Um, and so the electron transport chain requires oxygen, as we saw. It was at the last oxygen acceptor. And so, uh, so what can cells do in anaerobic situations where there is no oxygen? Anaerobic, the absence of oxygen. So there are different alternative pathways. Um, and so the absence of oxygen, a cell um, can go through anaerobic respiration or fermentation, which is basically um, the the electrons that have been accepted onto this NAD uh, positive, um, the NADH molecules that now exist holding on to those electrons, what are, what's going to happen to those? Uh, that's the, the, ultimate, um, the ultimate goal here. And so anaerobic respiration uh, can happen in, in multiple ways. Um, it can still use the electron transport chain uh, to produce ATP. Uh, many prokaryotes uh, use anaerobic respiration where, a, where the electron transport chain is used. And so basically, um, this picture here kind of shows uh, you've got glycolysis going down to the electron transport chain. Aerobic is what we do. And so oxygen is the last acceptor. And so that produces high ATP. Well, there's some that can go through the electron transport chain, but instead of oxygen, there are these other molecules that can accept the electron. And so you've got uh, NO3, uh, SO4, uh, CO2. And so these can accept the electron in different ways, but they will be producing less ATP, a minimum amount of ATP. Uh, and so these different electron acceptors will uh, allow for less ATP to be produced, uh, less than if oxygen were the last acceptor. Uh, and then you have fermentation. Fermentation is basically glycolysis taking place uh, to produce the ATP, uh, but there is no Krebs cycle or electron transport chain there to take place. Uh, and so that means all of your ATPs are being produced by glycolysis. And so as we saw, glycolysis does not produce very much. So this is not the most efficient way of creating energy, but lots of different prokaryotes, uh, bacterias, um, archaea uh, do it this way. And it's called fermentation which allows glyco glycolysis to continue producing small amounts of ATP. Uh, now, if this were to happen, you've got this creation of NADH uh, being produced. So you've got these electrons being released from the glucose molecule being broken down. And so if you were to not do anything with those electrons, because there's no electron transport chain, these NADHs would just keep accumulating and nothing would happen to it. So the cell has to come up with a way to <coughs> release those electrons from the NADH uh, so that that molecule NAD can accept more electrons once the glucose is being broken down. And so 
uh, there are t two different ways that this can take place. And basically, the pyruvate, which is produced from glucose, glucose mo or glycolysis, the glucose molecule is broken down into two pyruvates. Um, and then um, there, these cells have come up with a way for the pyruvate to then accept that electron in different ways. Uh, and those different ways are um, producing alcohol, producing lactic acid, and there are other byproducts. But those are the, the two that we will focus on. And so microbes uh, carry out uh, alcoholic fermentation. And so, um, you know, yeasts can do this, uh, other, other things can do this. And so basically what's happening is uh, that pyruvate that is being produced from, glyco uh, from glycolysis uh, will then be able to accept that electron from the NADH uh, and it will change it into an ethanol molecule. And so um, ethanol we find in wines, beers, alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages. Uh, there are some other alcohols as well, uh, but ethanol is what is produced here. And this is called alcoholic uh, alcohol fermentation, uh, where the NADH um, creates, where the NADH will attach to, uh, the electron from the NADH will attach to the pyruvate and create an ethanol molecule. Uh, and then there is something uh, called lactic acid fermentation. Uh, so bacteria can do this. But we can do this as well. Our muscle cells can do this. And so basically, uh, in a bacteria is constantly doing this because um, they don't have oxygen in them or the, they don't have the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. And so um, the electron that the NADH is holding on to will be released to the pyruvates and create lactic acid. Well, our muscles can do this uh, sometimes because there is not enough oxygen in our muscle cells to keep going. So we are exerting ourselves to the point that the mitochondria cannot keep up with the energy that we need um, and so because there's not enough oxygen. So our, our lungs can only breathe in oxygen. So so much oxygen. Uh, the bloodstream can only pump oxygen through to the cells at a certain rate. Uh, and so if our body needs more energy than what can be produced by that oxygen rate, um, then it can switch to this lactic acid fermentation. So basically, <coughs> there's no more oxygen in your cell because it's being used up by the mitochondria. Uh, and um, but it needs more energy, so it will go this route. Uh, and so you will then get lactic acid buildup uh, in your cells, and that's what causes, um, you know, cramping of the muscle later and things like that. Um, and so our cells can do this in an anaerobic situation where there's not enough oxygen.